What is going on, guys? It's Adam, a.k.a. Marf, and this is Marfugal News. Today, we actually have a very special guest, Rudy, from Alaska Prepper, and we're going to talk about and have a conversation about everything from the coming possible war to blackouts and a grid down to affordable prepping. This is going to be a very, very good convo, so you don't want to miss it. Before we get started, I do want to remind you guys we're completely independent. We're on our own. If you want to protect yourself against two of the most probable SHTF scenarios, uh, then go check out EMP Shield. This device can protect you against not only an EMP strike from any of our adversaries, but you can also protect yourself against a solar event from our sun. A Carrington level event will be grounded in less than 500 trillionths of a second before it's able to fry your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, generators, and of course your home. So make sure to go check it out, marfuglenews.com slash EMP. EMP, and make sure to use the code MARF. You'll get $50 off per device. So again, make sure to go check that out. Alaska Prepper, what is going on and how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, Marf. How are you doing? It's good to see you, man. So Rudy, uh, f- first of all, how long have you been prepping and what got you into it? Uh, when I was in the military, I was in Afghanistan. I was on my way home uh, for mid-tour leave. Thank you for your service, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, for mentioning it. But I was on my way home for mid-tour leave, and my buddy, Magdo, he gave me a, a book. It was called The Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. That book opened my eyes to how the government works. It led me to know that the government is not there for us, that the government is there for itself. Government produces nothing, therefore it has to take from someone in order to exist. I recommend that everyone read that book. It should be mandatory reading for high schoolers. So then I read another book. It's called A Creature from Jekyll Island, and that's by G. Edward Griffith. It allowed me to see why it is that they created the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve was created, in my opinion, for one reason and one reason only. It's the only way that the government can be in control of we the people through the money that it issues and makes us use. And then remember Hurricane Sandy, I think it was, that went through the East Coast, through New Jersey, New York. I remember seeing a video of a lady. She was running up to Senator Schumer and she was screaming, you need to help us. People are going to freeze. We need blankets. We need generators. Can you help us? That woke me up, Marf. Government is not going to be there when we really need them. All that gentleman was doing there was doing a photo op. That's it. What are the... What are the things you tell people why they should be prepping? So how would you say that to family? You want to open up the conversation so you can find something to open it with that's maybe happened recently. Let's say there's a hurricane somewhere. Hey, you hear there's a hurricane, right? Yeah, they lost their powers, whatever. I decided to go get me a small generator just in case we lose power here. What do you think about that? That opens up the conversation. And and then what I would follow that up with maybe during our next meeting or the next time that we get together is uh, I heard that a friend of mine lost his job and uh, he didn't have to worry about food because he had like three months of food. And and it's just things that happen in real life that happen all the time that happen to everyone. Almost everyone you know has probably lost a job here or there and they would have wished that they had food put away for three months. It doesn't have to be for a year. That's the beginning, right? That's the start. You're you're planting a seed. Exactly. And then what I think happens is, is that when a person starts that journey, just putting away food for a few months and maybe water, they start thinking about, wait a minute, what if I lose power? Oh, wait a minute, maybe if I'm gonna get a small generator, let me get a couple of five gallon cans so that I can have gas for the generator in case something does happen. And then they just follow through with everything that they deem necessary in order to maintain their personal family's standard of living. So as long as you can gather enough things that you can put away for a certain period of time that will allow you to maintain maintain your standard of living, meaning that you can still take a shower, that you can still drive your car, that your children are not going to starve, that you're going to have a band-aid in case one of your kids gets a cut, that you'll have all that stuff, then the better off that you'll be in any kind of a crisis. But I've always found that starting off with a little bit of food storage and saying, hey, just in case, you never know, that that usually starts a person on their prepper journey. And then after that, the sky's the limit, man. So we've got all of the crazy solar events happening right now. We're almost at the solar maximum 
of Solar Cycle 25, there has been flare after flare after flare. At the same time, you have more countries than ever in my lifetime uh, in, in almost a full scale war. And you have major, major superpowers right now preparing or in a current war and doing all sorts of weird things in space. They're launching rockets. They're weaponizing space. We're talking about direct energy weapons now all over the place. Do you think it's safe to say that the the kind of um, Visa logo, the overlap, I forget what those are called, with either war or with solar events, the two most probable, that either one of those has kind of an overlap of a grid down. Would you agree with that? It's going to happen. Like I said, it cycles. The last time that the sun affected the earth in a manner in which if we had technology the way that we do now, which shut down the electric grid all around the world was back in 1959. And it was an event called the Carrington event. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it. Now, about every 150 years or so, the earth gets smashed with a bloom of uh, plasma from the sun. Uh, and we're overdue for one. I mean, they've talked about this in Congress. There's experts all over the place that talk about this. It's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's just when. So I really don't worry too much about what can happen. I try to use that energy in order to prepare for anything. Because when you take into consideration, what do you really need to be prepared? You need water, you need food, you need medicine, you know, especially if you have a chronic illness, you need self-defense, you need warmth, you need shelter. There are some basic things that every human being needs. And if you start your preparedness journey with at least getting those things in order, you're going to be way better off than those people that are always being critical of the voice that's trying to warn them. So, you know, instead of worrying too much about what can happen, I just try to put my energy into what can I do to make it better for my family if something like this does happen so that we can survive the crisis no matter how short or how long it may be. That brings me to another question. How do you prepare mentally and physically for the stress and challenges of living through a prolonged event? This is my opinion, of course. We're going to have a whole bunch of people say, oh, no, you don't. I believe you have to have faith. You have to have something to look forward to. You have to have a higher power that you can pray to. And you also have to have a certain level of hardiness. You have to be able to see things and do things that normal every day will not show you. But I think that with faith, all of the things that you need will come as far as mentally goes. Uh, now, physically, there's two things. Don't be a fat body like me uh, in case you have to bug out. I don't ever plan on bugging out. I don't believe in being a refugee. Don't be a fat body. Be in shape. OK, but I think the most important thing on how you prepare physically is if you live in an area where you know it's going to get really bad, get out of there while you still can. That's something that you can control 100 percent now instead of waiting until it gets so bad that then you do become a refugee. How do you assess an event like a, a blackout? How can you tell if it's either a local issue or a catastrophic event? How would you as a prepper try to figure that out? Well, if you have a network of people people, if you have a MAG or a mutual assistance group, is what MAG stands for, then communications is going to be, you know, important. Let's take, for example, let's say that we had a coronal mass ejection, right? Or an EMP. There's ways of being able to tell if you had an event like that. So let's say that the electricity goes out. Okay. The electricity goes out. It happens all the time, not only here in Alaska, but other places too. Uh, but also let's say that uh, the electricity goes out. Your phone doesn't work. Your electronics don't work. You can smell that little um, uh, bit of electronic smoke and it stops working. And you can't use your cell phone. You can't use a landline. Uh, and maybe you have uh, buddies within your mag or your network that maybe have ham radios that can reach out to other parts of the country and or the world. And then maybe they can find out what actually happened. So that's a way that you can find out what the severity of the problem is. Now, let's say that we know that this blackout is going to last for years. What do you do? You go into survival mode. You start rationing everything you have. Like one of the first things I'll do, obviously, after I've got my family together and we're co-located and all that kind of stuff. First thing we do is we need to take care of security. If there is a vehicle that works, we need to go and stock up before the masses wake up. And I mean stock up more so than you are now. 
because an event like that it's not going to be over in a year it will take years before things come back to maybe 25 percent of normal and even if it was countrywide let's just say it's just the, the united states alone i don't know about you marv but i don't see very many countries out there that like us very much so who's going to come to help once we're at our lowest point i don't know i don't know what country will come to help us who's, who's strong enough to help exactly but we're the even, strongest if, yeah if we go down who's protecting us let's say something like that happened we need transformers right i believe that the transformers are made in two places one of them being south korea i forgot what the other place was all of these countries that are out there that call themselves our allies i think they do it out of necessity not because they really want to so my question is is that if we're ever as a nation on our knees and there's nothing that we can do without help who's really going to come to help us. You find out who your real friends are when you lose all your money. Well, we would find out who our real friends are if something like that ever happened. So this is why you stay prepared. You get prepared and you stay prepared. Uh, let's hope it never comes to that, okay? I don't personally believe in SHTF as in like it's the end of the world, like the end of civilization. I believe that we are going to be going through a shift that will end up bringing us into a new era of time. I believe that. And I believe that there will be a lot of suffering between now and that shift. Rudy, we're on the same page on that because when people think of, of World War III or they think of SHTF, they're attaching this the, the stereotypes of preppers and that they think it's the end of the world that you know everything is going to be demolished it's not the end of the world it's the beginning of a new one exactly and think about this marf why would you be preparing for the end of the world if i knew that next week was the end of the world i'd be partying it up i'd be like barbecuing every day i don't care if it's negative 45 outside i'd be enjoying my family if i knew that next week or next month or even next year was the end of the world so we need to get prepared now so that we can make it through the suffering that's going to occur for the next several years it's going to be for years uh, but then whoever makes it to the other side hopefully most people that make it to the other side will be patriots that love this country and that are well prepared that way we can start anew in a position of power instead of in a position of poverty so that's why i prepare and i advocate that everyone stay prepared always in every way that you possibly can how do you prioritize and manage resources like food water and power during a blackout and then do you how do you rack Ration food. When do you decide to start rationing? Well, I, I would decide to start rationing as soon as I found out that it is a long-term event, all right? Uh, because like I said, we lost power here for, I don't know, almost a week, but I knew that it was only going to be temporary. Was I rationing anything? Nothing at all. I was I was running my big generator 24 hours a day. That thing sucks up like 10 gallons of gas a day. I didn't care. I was just living life keeping my standard of living up the same that it was before, except that I had to hear the hum of a generator in the back of the house that I was running my house with. I knew the power was coming back on. No big deal. Had it been a major event that I knew the power wasn't coming back on, it'd be completely different. You know, it'd be rationing. It'd be taking out my systems that I have, my backup systems, to be able to run my house in an efficient manner. That brings me to my next question. What about alternative sources of power? And how do you maintain uh, power through a blackout without the grid? Great question. Uh, I, I always advocate that if you don't have a generator, get a gas powered generator first. If you look behind me, you'll see all of these uh, black boxes here. They're called solar generators. I love solar generators. I love solar panels. I love all those things, but I believe that it is more important for you to be able to have a gas generator that you can control how much gas you put away than to rely on a solar generator for the first thing that you use as a backup to power when you cannot control the sun. You can control how much gas you put away, but you can't control whether the sun's going to come out or not. So I always tell people, get a gas powered generator first that will power those things within your home that are essential to your home running the way that you need it to run i.e your refrigerator your freezer some lights in my case i have a water pump because i have a standalone utility system within my house my water pump my heaters electrical motherboard in case it's winter time so have a gas generator first now a solar generator i love because it makes a great complement 
to a gas generator. And I would never recommend that anyone get one or the other. I would recommend that you get both if you can, but if you can only get one, I don't care where you live, you should have a gas generator. What kind do you recommend? The best that you can afford. That's that's all you can do, right? So if you can get a $350 Furman from Costco, that's going to give you 2,000 watts of continuous power, and that's the best that you can afford, beautiful. Get that because you'll have it. If you can get a $1,500 or $1,100 Honda that puts out 2,200 watts and is supposedly a much better brand that will last the test of time, then great. Get that. But get the best that you can afford that's going to allow you to still prepare with other things that you need. Meaning don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Don't spend all your money that you have on one thing. Try to spread it around. That way you'll be uh, as diversely prepared as you possibly can be. I don't want to have a $10,000 generator and then not have any water filtration. So an event happens, you've got no hospital to go to, you've got no clinic to go to, you can't just go get an appointment at Advanced Healthcare. What medical supplies and knowledge do you consider essential for handling health emergencies during a blackout? It's funny. The reason I smile is because I just I just recorded a video about the five or six things that everyone should have for a SHTF. And this video for medicine, for medical equipment, you know what I have? I have a basic first aid kit. 95% of people that get hurt during any kind of an event, that's what happens. They get a scratch or something. And if there are no medical services available, a small scratch can get infected and you can expire from that. A cat scratch. Yeah, I got a scratch right here that's infected and it's good times right now. So imagine if I had a scratch like this that I didn't have medicine for, just basic alcohol, you know, um, band-aids. Yes, get band-aids. Triple antibiotic ointment. Get all of those basic things first and foremost because that's what you're going to use the most. Now, should you have a decompression needle in case you have a collapsed lung? Should you have a tourniquet? You should have all of the things that you can possibly get that you know how to use in an emergency. And even things that you don't know how to use, like a surgical kit. Because who's to say that you may need something like that in the future, but you find someone that does know how to use it that can help you or your family member out because you had the forethought of getting it ahead of time. Any equipment that you purchase for preparedness, don't just purchase the equipment. Do the best that you can do in order to learn how to use it and service it. That way, if you ever really need to use it, you'll be comfortable during a time of stress. If you're on medication, try to stock up on as much medication as you need, especially if it's life-saving medication. I know that you have Jace Medical as an affiliate of your channel, and I know that they offer a 12-month subscription service for RX. Take advantage of that now while it's still available. And you know what you do? If there's never a crisis where you need that 12 month because the medical services are still available, guess what you do? You rotate that medicine yep. and it never goes bad. But you always have the security and the insurance of knowing that you have it in case something does happen where it's no longer available. Yeah, I think that the Jace case is good for, you know, antibiotics, things like that. And then the Jace Daily is really awesome. It'd be a lifesaver, Marf. It could literally save someone's life. Now, out of all of the adversaries right now, which one do you think is the biggest threat? China. And why why do you say that? China. Not only are they a nuclear not only are they a nuclear power but they own a lot of our debt. I think people think that Russia is the lead for the BRICS countries, but I think that China is the lead for the BRICS countries. Uh, they're the ones that's getting everyone together to bypass the use of the Federal Reserve note, which will in turn make us Americans a lot poorer than what we are now. Once they bypass the dollar as the uh, vehicle that they use for trade internationally, just the 11 countries that are currently in the BRICS make up like 40% of the world population. Imagine what happens when the other 121 or so country that are applying to join the BRICS, join the BRICS and start bypassing the dollar. The dollar's use will be diminished, I would say, by at least 75%, if not more. What does that mean to the average American? That your standard of living will go down 75% unless you are prepared. And not to mention, as far as BRICS, it, and it's crazy, the list of countries that are all clamoring to do this, every other time that the U.S. dollar was thrown threatened. We've gone to war. What is different about this time? Do you think we'll go to war or do you think that we've already been in infiltrated? We are heading toward the major war cycle, not your Vietnam, not your Afghanistan or Iraq, your world war cycle. We are headed there. It's a cycle. The thing
thing is, Adam, is, is that human nature is not going to change over the millennia. Human nature will always be the same. There's like an 80 to a 100 year human cycle, which is called the turnings from the first, second, third, and fourth turning. Right now we are in the fourth turning, which is a crisis cycle. And there is world war ahead of us. And we will see a great taking of life. A lot of life will be lost. And all you have to do is just do math. Just go back every hundred years or so, right? And you'll see that we're headed toward a major war cycle. And this is going to be a really bad one. Correlation does not equal causation. So I don't know what it is that's going to tip off this next world war. I have no idea. One of the first things they say would happen is a martial law would be declared. What would be your first actions during a martial law? If I knew that they had just declared martial law and I had a bug out location, I'd be bugging out. I would be packing my stuff off and leaving as soon as I could. If I didn't have a bug out location, uh, I would go to part B. That would be uh, fortifying my home and making sure that I got security up. Because what are you going to do? Uh, I mean, think about this. It doesn't matter how tough you are. It doesn't matter how many firearms you have. If I'm looking at my outside camera and I'm in my house with my family and I see a stack of 12 outside my door, all right, with body armor with the full gear i'm not going to fight that fight i've been on the other side of that if paratroopers were dropping on into your skies oh. would you fight or run i would fight you'd have no choice this is our home you know sh should i should i go red dawn <laughs> you know if paratroopers were falling i'm uh, we're talking about like foreign forces right not american forces. Yeah, yeah yeah foreign forces. yeah yeah we would have to fight i mean what are you what else are you gonna do you have to fight i don't want to fight you know i don't want to have to use a firearm but this is our country and if somebody invades our country it, in my opinion it is the duty, first and foremost, of the men of that country to pick up arms. And then, in the end, if it comes to it, it will be the duty of every citizen to pick up arms if they have to in order to protect their homeland. This is our country, and we're going to preserve it. You cover all, a lot. I mean, you, you are very perceptive. You catch a lot of these things in the news cycle as well. We're at recruitment shortfalls. The, the young generation does not want to join the military. Quite the opposite. They're saying that, you know... TikTok is behind it. This is behind it. Whatever is behind it. We have young that hates old. We have this religion hates this religion. This color hates that color. The right hates the left. Something goes down. World war cycle starts. The military's out somewhere else. Our local police are the ones who are most likely going to be watching. Yeah. We don't have enough military, so they're going to be scattered. You saw the Sheriff Rick Jones stuff, right? Yeah, yeah I did. They're talking about nationwide events. What would you say to the people? people that are concerned that first of all the police have been treated not too great over the last five years what do we do to protect yourself not only against foreign adversaries but possibly groups that now have taken control over local areas well you know i've thought about this a lot actually over the last several years so what you're saying is is let's say that our nation was at war internally remember during the obama administration where he got rid of a whole bunch it was in the hundreds of general officers you know majors lieutenant colonels colonels generals admirals and stuff like that yep loss of confidence yes a lot of them were gotten rid of yeah do you think that that leadership is not still around they're still around only because they got kicked out of the military or were made to retire it doesn't mean that they're not there it doesn't mean that they don't have the experience and leadership abilities that they had before they're still there was george washington a general before he became the the head of the army he wasn't a general he was what was he a farmer right so all of these generals colonels and stuff that are sitting on the sideline right now they're going to be able to lead a huge army in my opinion that are of fighting age and that have already been trained in the military there is an army within our nation and it's called veterans and of all of the veterans that are out there even after you take out the percentage of veterans that can't fight because they're disabled and you take out the percentage of veterans that won't fight there's still about 20, 30 million veterans in this country that are of fighting age and that will take up under the leadership of all of those generals, colonels, lieutenant colonels, majors. We have an army already. It's sitting there until we need to get together and actually fight. So when the fight finally comes to us, if it ever does, we will clean house with anyone that tries to invade this country by putting boots on ground. No country will put boots on ground in the United States of America because we will clean house.
miles. That I stand with. I kind of disagree because I feel like that's what's happening right now with folks that are coming in. Yeah. That there could already be millions of boots on the ground. And I think they would be strategic about it. There was a couple stories that happened like uh, California accidentally it was very sketchy leaked every gun owner in california yeah i remember that where they located it you remember that and then you have all of our information we've all been profiled down to a t by china yeah so for instance say china takes over they've been practicing with the specific port busting bomb they turn off the cranes that they control with their computer system proprietary systems we can't import stuff they take out our ports they hit our airfields they've been buying up land right next to our bases they quickly take over those those bases they target those they target every weapon owner everybody who's on that list of of you know gun owners and they could even do this with drone swarms which they have now put ai into so they can target specific addresses go all at one time and go boom 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 take out everybody all at once and that's how they would start the chunk meanwhile the same time everything starts off with people that have infiltrated they all have a position they all have a place that that's how i would envision if there was people in our country that they would have done it just like red dawn in 1984 they said that they came over from the south that they infiltrated first they set things up pre-hand they got people in the right places which obviously there was a very suspicious time a few years ago with the selection in november all of this would be kind of pre-set down just like in dragon day or in Red Dawn, where the mayor is already kind of on the side of it, handing out bracelets. Marf, in Red Dawn, we ended up winning. I've often said that in the end, we will win. It is we, people that are good, that will win over evil. I think that China is smart enough that they don't want to destroy life throughout the entire world. I don't think we're going to have a nuclear war. If we do, it'll be very small and concentrated, right? And then people will be in an uproar and say, we cannot do this. It may also be tactical nukes, which are not as destructive. I think we're on the same page on that as well, that they want to take us in one piece. Yeah, they don't want to spoil the wealth. Look at Chernobyl, and you still can't live in it. Why would you want to overtake a nation by irradiating it to the point where you're not going to be able to occupy it? To me, that makes no sense. Well, recently, uh, Russia started making some of the biggest conventional bombs ever made. They're conventional. They say that they're doing it for Ukraine. But we suggested, you know, fill in instead of Ukraine, NATO. So those for NATO, Russia, China, Iran, all of these team up, Cuba, Venezuela, they use their network through Venezuela. I think that you're right. They wouldn't destroy everything. I think that's why a civil conflict, if they were able to create that, if they were able to destroy us one piece at a time, like taking out infrastructure and chunks down, 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 that we would take ourselves down and then there's minimal dam damage to the actual structure of things. Lights turn back on different owners. Yeah, they're going to put people in here and they probably already have people in here that can take care of the water, water infrastructure, poison it, the food, whatever. I do believe that there's a lot of sleeper cells already, but we will survive. We will win in the end. The question is, is how many are going to be left once we win? Well, Rudy, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and you're a very awesome guy on and off camera. You've been on our friends page for a long time. In fact, if you want to go check out Alaska Prepper, you can actually go right over to marfuglenews.com slash friends, and then underneath our mod section is all of our creator friends. You can find him at the very top. It is alphabetical. Rudy, of course, has uh, great, great videos, tons and tons. He's been putting out content for years, uh, so make sure to go check him out. Uh, Rudy, thank you so much for coming on today, and uh, a big thank thanks you. to Dex. Dex is editing this, so this has all been put together by Dex, and uh, thank you to Dex as well. And I got to see Dex for the first time today, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes, that's right. You saw him on our uh, stream system. Yeah. Uh, by the way, he has videos. You can see him on the show. Oh, really? Uh, he took over for me when I, I was on vacation. So Every single time that I've come over, it's always been a great time. So I truly do appreciate you inviting me and having me over uh, here visiting with you and your community. And ladies and gentlemen, listen, it doesn't matter where you get it, but just get it. Get yourself prepared. Well, thank you, uh, Rudy. And thank you so much for giving us your time. Your time is valuable. So I appreciate it, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, man. It was very, it was a lot of fun being here.